We've also got two very important guests here today. Um, our first guest is State Senator Ron Billabong, who was recently elected to the Illinois State Legislature. He was born and raised on the northwest side of Chicago, the son of Indian immigrants. His parents came here in the 70s, and he is the first elected Indo-American state senator for the state of Illinois. So we're very, very happy to have him here. Um, prior to his work that he did in the past with home care for seniors and people with disabilities, he worked at the federal level of government for U.S. Congressman Brad Schneider as his outreach director. And in this role, he was responsible for outreach on a variety of policy issues and had duties that ranged from signing people up to for the Affordable Care Act to organizing job fairs, all the kinds of things that many of the companies and the people working for those companies are concerned about when they come to Chicago. Um, Senator Bill Ballin is looking forward to being an effective, proactive, and progressive voice for the people of the 8th District. That's where Skokie is. And um, he works actually representing communities outside of Chicago and within the city of Chicago. That's why I thought, we thought he'd be a good um, advocate here today. Um, issues such as income equality, reducing gun violence, providing a quality education to children regardless of the zip code, and advancing both women's and LGBTQ rights. He is um, serving in other roles in the area as president of the Indo-American Democratic Organization and serves on the board of Gun Violence Prevention PAC. Senator Villadon, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you for saying my name right. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so someone reminded me that we're in Congressman uh, Roger Krishnamurthy's district, and uh, it just reminds me, I think I've known him, and it reminds me of when I, when I was running, uh, two things happened. You know, one, uh, so I, I ran for the 8th State Senate District. He was the... Uh, He's obviously the 8th, 8th, 8th Congressional District, 8th U.S. Congressional District. So, of course, you know, as soon as I announced the few the first phone calls I got, I can't believe you're running against Raja. And I said, I'm not doing that. I'm running for, for State Senate. And then you kind of talk about the different levels of government and how it's, how um, I have, there's State Senate, Congress, State Rep, Alderman, uh, which is part of the conversation today. Um, and, you know, I also remember knocking on doors and talking to folks, and a couple of years ago, uh, Congressman Krishnamurthy had a kind of catchy commercial. Uh, it was called, uh, Just Call Me Raja. Yeah. And uh, people remember that. So it would, uh, Ellie's not, uh, not Ellie's uh, stepped outside, but probably two or three times a week, I would knock on a door, and they, the, the lady or, or man would open the door like, oh, we're good, just, just call me Raja. I, I'm gonna go for you. And depending on how long the conversation was taking place, I'd either be like, yep, thank you, here's my card, or, well, actually, I'm not, you know, and so uh, it's, uh, it's, I'm glad that uh, there's no confusion, even though I'm in his district today, um, but uh, he's doing an incredible job in, in Congress. Um, I want to thank Leslie, thank Michael, thank you all for inviting me to be here today. Um, I hopefully am not, uh, I've had enough caffeine, I was up since 4 o'clock, I was six month old. Um, and uh, he had one of those nights. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it was really important for me to be here. Michael and I go back uh, to uh, 20, oh, 13, okay. Um, and, uh, and working for Congressman Brad Schneider was such an incredible honor, um, mainly because I got to learn a lot. I got to learn a lot about um, economic development. I got to learn a lot about constituent services how people, uh, how companies in the private sector can interact with government. Uh, and that's something that I'm able to take with me to this job. Um, and so for background, my district uh, has 21 neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. It uh, has about six suburban municipalities, Lincolnwood, about two thirds of Skokie, parts of Niles, Morton Grove, Glenview, unincorporated Des Plaines. Um, so about half city, half suburbs. It also is probably the most diverse uh, uh, area in, in the state. Um, so, you know, I, I uh, just started saying this last week. Um, my, uh, one of my state reps is an Irish Catholic. Uh, there's a Queen of All Saints um, area. And then my other state rep, because there's two state reps per Senate district, is an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. And I'm the Indian Hindu guy. 
Um, and so you can literally, I mean, it, it almost sounds like the start of a joke, uh, the Hindu rabbi and Irish guy walk into a bar. Um, but it, it really is diverse, and I say that because, I mention it specifically because uh, we've been able to thrive on that diversity. Uh, we've been able to, uh, you know, with the highest concentration of Asian Americans, highest concentration of Jewish Americans, Greek, uh, and, and so forth, um, it, it really has uh, brought people together to make our community stronger. Um, I, you know, started my term in January, and um, it's exciting. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, I tell people, no matter where you were on the political spectrum or where you are, um, after the four, last four years in Illinois, you're ready to turn the page. Um, whether you were on the left or right, middle, wherever, um, we're just, uh, I, think, uh, I think the excitement at the state level is um, hopefully we can start to get things done. Uh, and part of that enthusiasm, I think, comes from uh, the fact uh, that um, obviously we have a new administration, but also there's about 30% of the legislatures new. So about 51 out of the 177 legislators uh, in the state legislature are new. Um, which I think is good because you have, you have fresh perspectives, new ideas, uh, but you also have some of the institutional knowledge um, that's, that's been there for some time, uh, which is important uh, because there are certain things that um, we've done in the past that we shouldn't do again, and having those folks there uh, can help with that. Uh, but then there are certain things that we need to revisit, and, and, and people asking questions that are new uh, is important. Um, and so I'm glad to be here today, uh, and I really want to make this more of a conversation and answer any questions you all might have. Uh, but um, the work that you all are doing is incredibly important. Uh, we, um, as a state, um, as local municipalities, um, have to interact with the rest of the world. Um, that is, we're living in a global economy. We have to uh, make sure that uh, we're acting like it. And I think we um, are... I can, and I'm going to touch on some of the state policy that state policies that we're working on, um, but that doesn't happen unless there's these types of partnerships. Uh, it doesn't happen un unless there is the local government talking to the state government, talking to the federal government. Um, it doesn't happen if all of those three entities are not talking to the private sector, not talking to um, people that are wanting to do the investment. Uh, and so um, I think more than anything, it, if I leave with one message, or if you leave with one message from, from my end, is please reach out to us. Please reach out to us. You know, as, as uh, you know, Michael and I were just talking, uh, this is a state of about 13 million people. So uh, the governor and, and his administration have a very tall task in front of them because they're trying to represent every different community, and um, th th their learning curve is a short one. And as a re as, uh, the reason I'm saying that is, you have local state reps, you have local state senators, please reach out to us, please use us as a resource, please use us as a recruiting mechanism um, you know, in the state of Illinois. Um, a few of the, the pieces of legislation, uh, first more broadly and then uh, specifically, I'd like to talk, touch on is um, a couple things. One is I, I'm, I'm kind of a blunt person, so I'll just say, um, there, there is a, uh, there, there are real statistics that show people are leaving the state of Illinois. Um, and, you know, we've had that debate. Um, we can continue to have it. Uh, quite frankly, I think it's more productive to find out what we're going to do about it. And I think back to why people came here in the first place. Um, when you look at that, uh, I, I point to two very specific factors. Um, we're a transportation hub. Uh, we uh, are in the middle of the country, we're in the middle of the Midwest, we have, I think, the second busiest airport, um, and we have rail, we have uh, pretty much a, a decent uh, uh, transportation system, uh, and so people, businesses, find it accessible to live here, find it um, a, a, a place where they can um, do their business or they can travel, and it could be a connector to the rest of the country, really. Um, secondly, was is our education system. Um, it's it's our both our K through 12, but higher ed, and even in addition to that, workforce. Um, we have the best universities in the country: Northwestern, U of C, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, we are able to produce real talent. We have started to. And I, I walked in, and pardon me if I'm repeating um, some of these items, 
but we talk, someone was talking about the manufacturing sector. I mean, look, looking at what, at what Harper College is doing with um, their, their, their uh, apprenticeship program there. For, and um, I think we don't spend enough time talking about community colleges and the fact that people, you know, at least with one or two, one or two years of exposure in high school, they can go to a community college and get an associate's degree in manufacturing. And, and, and from my days at, at working for Congressman Schneider, I think the 10th district is the fourth highest concentration of manufacturing out of any congressional district in the country. Um, so it's important that we double down on programs like that. Um, and so we, um, you know, we uh, have those two very specific factors that um, has gotten us to where we, where we have been. Uh, unfortunately, we took a turn in the wrong direction. Um, and it's not just the last four years, it's even before that. Um, you know, you look at our transportation and infrastructure system, um, we, we're at about a C, C, C minus, C plus, something like that. I, I, I kind of laugh when people say plus or minus. I mean, does it really matter that much um, if we qualify the C? Um, we have work to do. Um, and our higher education system took a hit. It took a hit over the last four years. You know, there was a 31% proposed cut. We cut you know, MAP grants. Um, and I think um, that, was at, that was at a real cost. Uh, but I, I, I'm incredibly optimistic about uh, moving forward. Uh, there has been an incredible commitment uh, from the legislature, from uh, the uh, governor to um, right the ship. Uh, and you could see that, number one, with the governor's budget address. Um, look, at, look at the items that he funded, look at the increases he's made in higher education. Mind you, with the budgetary uh, challenges that we that are inherent inherent in what we uh, in what he inherited, I should say. Um, we also have a commitment to a capital plan. Um, this is the first one in ten years. Um, you know, this is an important uh, step that we're taking. And you know, uh, let me step back and say that I'm on both the appropriations committees in uh, Springfield. I'm on the I'm the vice chair of transportation and on the um, on the joint subcommittee of transportation and appropriations. So we're in the process, we just had our first one two weeks ago, um, or a week ago, sorry. And um, we're going throughout the entire state to do, we're holding hearings throughout the entire state to find out what our capital needs are. So we're going to Elgin and, and uh, we're gonna be in Chicago, Elgin, Decatur, um, uh, Springfield, and Joliet, I believe, and a couple other places. Um, but the, 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 the importance of this is we're making the case. We know that we have infrastructure needs. We know that we have transportation needs. Um, so we need to find out what they are, and we need to find out what the best revenue mechanisms are to make that happen. Um, quite frankly, this is incredibly important because this is what we hear from the business community, right? They want to be able to have uh, a transportation and infrastructure system that they can work with, where they can transport their goods and services. Uh, and so um, we're looking at a, approximately $50 billion capital plan um, to, to address um, some of these needs. Um, again, the commitment on higher education is there, but it's not just higher education, it's not just K through 12, it's figuring out the different pathways for, 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 for students. Uh, not everyone is gonna be able to go to a four-year college, um, and I think that's something important that we're trying to be creative about. You know, other items that we're working on um, is includes tax policy. Uh, we, um, you know, are moving forward with what's called a small business uh, job creation tax credit. Um, we, we know how hard it is to create jobs. Um, we want to ease that pain um, or ease that challenge uh, for small businesses. Uh, and so there's a job, job creation tax credit. If you're paying your employee at least, you know, I think, I think it's $15 an hour, you get a, a tax credit. Uh, we're looking at a, um, a, uh, a, t a hiring tax credit, or I'm sorry, yeah, a, sorry, a training tax credit. And that's important too because um, we have some industries in our area that have a high turnover. And um, I, that's a challenge for a number of reasons, but for a small business um, to be able to recruit, um, interview, uh, uh, hire, train, uh, and then get that person going, um, it's, a, it's, it's at a cost. It's at a cost. And so we recognize that and we're working on legislation to create um, a uh, hiring tax credit, or sorry, a training tax credit. Um, so those are two tax credits we're working on. We're trying to figure out a third piece, um, which is um, the cap that took place at the federal level 
with the SALT deduction, uh, the state and local income tax. So California has passed uh, legislation, Washington I, too, I believe as well, um, to essentially make it so that um, whatever um, people would, would deduct above that cap, um, they can make a charitable deduction or a charitable contribution to the state and then they would get a 100% deduction. Um, the IRS is, um, let's just say, uh, uh, they're, they're figuring out their opinions on it. Um, and, but that's something that we want to pursue because we know that disproportionately impacts the people in the state of Illinois. Um, so we're, we're, we are taking a serious look at uh, tax policy because we know that's a big part of uh, how people make their decisions to invest and do business in the state of Illinois. Um, I think, uh, you know, the other piece that I think, um, the biggest piece, again, going back to what I said in the beginning, and then I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions, is how we market the state of Illinois. Um, we have to, uh, again, we've, we're coming from four years uh, that have been tough, but we have incredibly incredible amount to offer. Um, you know, whether it's the, the fact that we're working on our infrastructure and transportation system, our workforce development, um, our tax policy at the state level, and other economic challenges. Um, what I would just submit to you all is that um, we need to um, engage our elected officials. We need to hold them accountable. We need to utilize them. Um, I tell folks in my office, or uh, they come to my office, um, if you're if you're talking about recruiting a business, if you're talking about um, a nonprofit having a challenge, talk to talk to me, talk to your local elected official, talk to your federal. Let's get together. Let's sign a letter together. Let's meet with the business that we're trying to recruit um, together. Let's show them that we are committed to making their transition into the state of Illinois as easy as possible. Um, and and I think that's what I'm committed to. I think. Um, again, with turning the page, I think people are ready to do that on a number of different fronts. Um, so uh, th that's what I basically had to say today. I, I think that um, there's a huge opportunity in front of us, and we just have to seize it. Uh, and I'm, you know, I, I know that I'm a, a willing partner. I believe the governor is as well. And I think each of your elected officials will be as well. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ron, thank you so much for coming out. I mean, this is great. I always love seeing you. And before you go, oh, actually, before we, we have a couple of questions, and then, um, so great. So, Teresa, you had a question? Yes. On the edge tax credit, is there movement on that to expand it, and is there retention opportunity to be included in that as well? I think there is. Um, I think, um, look, the, uh, I think this is the time to voice, voice your opinions uh, on that, on that uh, at the edge tax credit. Um, they just, you know, the governor, um, fo the folks have uh, appointed their DCEO uh, secretary. Um, I, I know that I'm in the process of trying to get uh, that person out to my district to hear from people. Um, but I think that um, the number one uh, objective from an economic development standpoint from this governor, from what I've seen and been, has been conveyed to me, is he wants to be the ambassador for the state of Illinois. And, you know, this is someone that, you know, started 1871, so I think... He has a record, of, in, in addition to other items, but he has a record of trying to make sure we retain and recruit business. Okay. Which, but I would encourage you to make sure people hear from you. So, All right. Um, after the governor's budget address, and you know, it was nice and everything, but then I think yesterday Fitch came out with an article saying, this really isn't going to work for us. How, how does that change, or does it change, the plan that the governor has? And I'm assuming yeah. that's well aware. You know, it's a really good question. Um, what I would tell you is that uh, the governor's budget address um, is a starting point. Um, it's something that, quite frankly, we haven't had. Um, it, it, when I say by that, it's like we've, and, and I'm not trying to cast blame on one side or the other, but for the last four years, you know, there's literally been a line in the, in the budget address saying, working together equals $4 billion. I don't know. I mean, I work. With, I work together with a lot of people. I don't think it equals four billion ever. Uh, but you know, we have real numbers with this budget address. Um, there was real revenue um, from a few a few different uh, mechanisms. Uh, but it's a starting point because you know the legislature. I have to weigh in and, and we have to look at it. 
Uh, it's not going to be easy to get out of the hole that we're in. Look, we have backlog of bills. We have, um, you know, a, a structural budget deficit already in addition to our pension liability. Uh, but the reality is, I think this is a step in the right direction. And um, I think that um, I'm not a credit expert, but um, I think that if we can balance this budget, mm -hmm. um, you know, come May, um, th that Fish and other folks will see that as a step in the right direction. The pension issue, I think, is a major issue for the creditors. Um, that's not going to that's not going to be solved overnight. Um, it's something that we have to deal with, and I think it goes back to reforming our tax code, which is something that we're working on as well. Thank you. Want to ask me about property taxes or anything? We have to <laughs> <laughs> All right, just check. No, the only thing I'd say is for the employer tax credit. Yeah. And that's basically bringing back something that used to exist. Yes. And about, in a previous life, I had an architecture firm and still do, but as we were hiring folks, that was a critical piece. So really getting that engaged helps everybody at that local level. I think it was a $2,500 tax credit yeah. that helped on the employer side. So that is something I know I'm working with SBAC. And the other piece uh, for funding, get my ask in, is uh, fully funding the PTAC program. Yes. So we, up in Waukegan is GWDC, we have a procurement technical assistance center now. Yeah. And we're having to work with College of DuPage because the taxes, or not the taxes, the state of Illinois only put so much in their budget. We have the local match, the federal match, not the state match. Yeah. So if we can increase that, since that's now your committee, so yeah. I am thrilled to know that you're on that committee. Yeah. We'll have other discussions down the road. Yeah, and, I, and just to, add, to finish, it, we, have a, we have to go back, and that's why we need to hear from you all. We have to go back. The PTEC is one portion. The small de business development centers that were across the state of Illinois, over half of them closed. You know, so we need to we need to look at that again. Um, and the last thing I'll just add real quick yeah. is, um, we also you know one of our biggest strengths in the state of Illinois is our diversity and the ability for us to to speak different languages. And I think that um, that's incredibly important when we talk about foreign um, direct investment and. Um, we're working with the um, Department of, on Professional Licensing um, to add languages to um, the li different license exams that they, uh, and certifications that they have folks take. Um, so it, we're trying to make it more accessible. But I think that's an incredibly important part to how we recruit businesses is the fact that we can ease, like, like, no, like many other states can't, we can ease the transition uh, for people coming from other countries uh, because of our diversity, because of our language access. Great. Well, let's give a round of applause. Thank you so much. All right. So, Josh, I'm going to need you to help me with the uh, screen in a second, but I want to bring, bring on Bruce Ellsworth, and he's our international investment specialist with Select USA and the U.S. Department of Commerce. And I'm going to read a little bit. So you get applause, you show up, Bruce. You know, you get the same type of reaction when we visit you in DC. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's always fun when we're talking with folks from DC because they're, all the things that they do have these polysyllabic elements to their titles. So Bruce is a foreign commercial service officer in the International Trade Administration of the US Department of Commerce in Washington, DC. Bruce's responsibilities cover the promotion of foreign direct investment to the U.S. from around the world with a special focus on China, the Nordic countries, Russia, the Ukraine, and Eurasia. Before joining the U.S. government, Bruce served as the head of market access, patient advocacy, and, pa and public affairs at Shire Pharmaceutical in Japan and as senior director of corporate government affairs and policy for the Johnson & Johnson family of companies in Japan. Bruce has a Master's of Arts in International Affairs from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and he received his Bachelor of Arts in International Studies from Austin College in Texas. So thank, thank you. you. So Bruce, thank coming you, on up, and I know we're going to be doing the, you know, your slide deck as we go, but I yes. just need to get this screen down. John had a special way to do it after we broke the remote earlier. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, I'll, I'll just... Um, well, while he fixes that, I'll just start right away. Michael left off the most important part of my bio. I did. I went to elementary school and <laughs> middle school in Chicago. Uh, lived on Sheridan Road. 
uh, near Foster Beach and Montrose Beach. Grew up uh, uh, eating hot dogs uh, while watching the Cubs. And uh, later on, when I moved out of Chicago, I kept on asking people, where's the L? <laughs> no one understood me, but uh, uh, the good news is uh, I, after a long career in the private sector, living mainly in Asia, uh, my wife said, let's go back to the U.S. for a while, and so she made me apply for this job in the Foreign Service, uh, which allowed me to live in Washington for three years, and then this summer I'm going back to Asia, and I will uh, be this time in a city called Kaohsiung, which is in southern Chinese Taipei or Taiwan, and uh, it's very hot there. The, good, the bad news is I was originally supposed to be assigned to Moscow, but due to the sanctions, the Russian government wouldn't give me a visa. Oh. But I didn't know that, so I bought all, you know, being from Chicago, I bought a new pair of moon boots, <laughs> heavy coat, warm, you know, double layer underwear. Well, Kaohsiung is one of the hottest, most humid cities in the world. None of that clothing would do me any good. So what I need is I need a select USA, I mean a select Chicago t-shirt to go with this hat. Because it's so hot, I and mean, this is what I wear every day. I'll be the official select Chicago ambassador to Taiwan. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Now that we've gotten the important things out of the way, I will continue uh, to tell you what's so exciting about working together. The International Trade Administration is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. We have 1,423 people working to help U.S. businesses. Half of them are around the world in, our, in 70 countries, the more developed countries where we have U.S. embassies and consulates. So that includes 250 foreign service officers like myself, plus 500 local staff hired in each country. So they speak the local language even better than us. And they're there long term. And these people are, are they're tasked with helping US companies promote exports, and more recently, helping promote foreign investment back to the US. The other half of our 1,400 people is based in the United States. And the International Trade Administration has offices in 108 cities across the United States, including Chicago. And I'd like to um, introduce Hovan. Huh? Hovan, would you please stand up for a moment? He is the uh, executive director of U.S. Export Assistance Center in Chicago, and he covers greater Chicago, everything around here. And uh, he is, he, the other, the last group of our people are in Washington, D.C., about 250 people in Washington, D.C. But this is a well-integrated global team of 1,400 people which means that if you have a need in almost any country in the world, Hovan can find the right person in the right country, and each one of our embassies and consulates has staff assigned to each industry sector. He can tell you who does telecommunications in Kazakhstan. He can tell you who does electronic vehicles in uh, Pakistan or Malaysia. He can tell you that very quickly, he can do a personal introduction, and they can get you in to meet potential partners and government offices. Very quickly. And so, I'm here to tell you more about the biggest change to the International Trade Administration in the past five years, and that is the addition of Select USA. So until six years ago, we were mainly focused on promoting exports and breaking down foreign trade barriers. We have a team uh, in China right now breaking down some barriers. And hopefully, uh, they're very successful. But uh, during the recession, after Lehman shock, the financial downturn, people were looking around and saying, what can we do to help the economy? Private companies aren't investing. Someone said, hey, well, let's promote foreign direct investment. 
And they said, all the other countries around the world are doing this, but the United States is the only country that doesn't have a federal government office doing this. So they created Select USA office, and they said, everyone around the world that's been promoting exports for the past 30 years, you're now doing investment promotion as well. And everyone in these 108 offices across the United States, like Hovan, your team's also doing investment promotion as well. And it's been a slow process to learn how to do this because it's not the same as promoting exports. But we're learning, we're adapting, and uh, we're connecting. So what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of a deeper dive into how we do that. And, uh, you know, it's exciting that, that there's so many people excited about doing this because we're ready to help. So I'm going to just walk to the front so I can see what I'm talking about better. And um, if I click the slides by pushing the button? Yes. Good. Then I will do that. So, first of all, you all know this, but um, the United States is a wonderful place to invest. We have consumers that spend a lot of money. We have businesses that invest and do very innovative things. It's a great environment. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to make it even better and uh, bring more investors. This is the basic reason why Select USA exists and why Select Chicago is a great idea. So our mission so there is the third mission of the International Trade Administration, and we promote business investment. And because we're a federal function, we don't like to step on the toes of anyone at the state level or the city level. And I'll be very careful with your toes. Well, thank you. <laughs> but um, so we recognize that we have a role that we can play that complements yours, and we won't try to do things that are better done at the state level, at the city level, or better done by a private sector. It's very important. But over the past six years since we were created, uh, and we started doing the annual Select USA Summit, the foreign companies that come to our summit have invested $96 billion in the United States. And then the ones that come to us and ask for help, and we try to be helpful, we assist them in some way or another. We're not always the, the key crit decision factor, but we're, all, we're trying to be helpful in various ways. Those companies that have received our assistance have invested $44 billion. And that number is actually old, a few months old, $46 billion to date. Um, and we're, we're working hard to improve our, our operational excellence. We have annual targets. We have metrics. We track our metrics every week, every month. When we're behind in an area, we think about reallocating our resources, what we can do better. And that's why the Department of Commerce tries to hire people like Boban and myself, where we have a background in the private sector. Because they know that mentality is what's needed to get people in the government to actually be more efficient and metrics oriented and delivering results. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to get our teams to be very efficient and metric oriented. So we did a little bit of digging and, uh, you know, I know someone else earlier today mentioned that there's uh, 100 billion foreign direct investment in the Chicago area, 1,800 companies, and I asked my research team if they could do a little bit of digging into Chicago, and this is uh, some of the initial numbers they found, but um, they found this data is a little bit old, so we need to figure out how to update them, but there are, uh, in the Chicago area, we found you all found uh, 1,000 new jobs in the past year. We found, as of 2012, 207,000 jobs in the Chicago area that are by foreign affiliated firms that we could recognize. And this data probably doesn't capture everything. The number is actually probably much bigger. And these are direct employment numbers.
numbers. They're not the indirect. So uh, the impact is, is very big. And these are very well-paying jobs, higher than the average, higher uh, than the, not only the average firm, but higher than the national average. And foreign companies, when they come here, they usually have some advanced technology, some innovation, robotics, something that will help them be competitive. And they leverage that. And as a result, when they hire people, they usually pay a higher than average salary. And you see that in this number, the average salary of people working for foreign companies in Chicago area, $87,000. That's not a bad average. We also uh, looked at the sources. And uh, we have a couple of databases. Uh, one of them tracks greenfield and expansion investments. It does not include mergers and acquisitions. So this particular database showed 387 greenfield and expansion investments in the Chicago area by foreign companies. And these are the top sources, the top 10. And you can see the top four are, well, top, many of them are in Europe. We also have Japan. We also have China. And uh, I think as time goes on, you'll see more and more companies, countries being a source that are not necessarily in Europe. So we have to branch out farther and look for new sources. And then we said, OK, let's look at those 387 greenfield and expansion projects that we haven't seen announced in the past 10 years. What sectors? And these are the top 10 sectors. Uh, 89 of them were related to software and IT. Then we had business services, financial services. We even had textiles. Uh, food and tobacco usually isn't tobacco. Usually it's food and uh, processing, taking commodities and processing them to make higher value added foods. But it's very diverse. And uh, what, it's exciting to see that there's FBI from so many industries and countries here in my home, uh, home uh, city of Chicago. So how do we help you do this? We have three categories of services that we do at the federal level where we try very carefully not to step on anyone's toes. Thank you. Uh, the first thing is we provide information. So when a foreign company comes, I don't know what to do. Many companies come to us and say, well, I want to invest in uh, New York, uh, Miami, or Los Angeles. We say, why? Well, look at Statue of Liberty, Disney World, and Disneyland. <laughs> and we say, you're missing a few other opportunities. Um, so we go on to a variety of databases, federal and private databases, to show, we start with a cluster map based on their industry, employment in every single county of the United States in that company's industry sector. That way they can identify where the current talent lies. And that's a very good hint, because if there's already employment there, there's probably a great university with a, a you know, training even more people, research programs. There's probably the right suppliers in place. It's probably almost everything they need. But we provide a, a roughly 8 to 10 page initial report for that company highlighting what I call the hidden gems across the United States, county by county. And they start with maps that are color coded uh, and work, on, work from there. So we try to give a national view but highlight places that people wouldn't have normally thought of. The second thing is we connect people. And we have, uh, as I said, people in 108 cities just like Hovan. And we, have, we call them up and say, we have this foreign company. Who should we connect them to? And so for example, there was a, a company called Homestar, a Chinese company from southern China, Guangzhou area. They make furniture. They had previously invested in North Carolina. They were expanding in Walmart. And Target, they wanted to build some distribution centers. What did I do? I 
call up Roy. Roy, can you call up the president of Homestar? Within a, within a few days, he had connected to the president of Homestar. A gentleman named, uh, his American, English name is Kevin. Uh, I'm sorry to say, Roy, uh, due to the tariffs, Homestar's investment plans are on hold temporarily. <laughs> but they'll be back. But we are going to stay on it. Sure. And when they build their distribution center in Chicago, I would love to come back and open a few champagne bottles with all of you. Wouldn't that be good? So we connect people all the time. Uh, foreign investors meet with our commercial officers and embassies and consulates around the world at trade shows around the world. Uh, and they say, where do I go? And we just try to connect people. Now, one thing we don't do is we don't try to give preference to one region or another region. We try to be neutral. So what we try to do is we try to show data showing the top 10 or top 20 hidden gems. That way it's based on data, not based on our who, where we have friends. We also try to ask the company, where would you like to be introduced? Um, currently, we don't have a system to send out trade leads, because if we send out trade leads to each of the 3,700 economic development organizations in our database, they would be overwhelming. So we haven't figured out how to do that well. So we usually go to the company, show the data, where would you like to be introduced, and we make personal introductions. But where we can attest, we have made introductions to the Chicago area recently. And we appreciate that. Thank you, Bruce. Yes. Oh, the third one is we help them navigate the federal system. And that's what we do best. The most common question, how to get a visa. We get that question more and more frequently these days because fewer and fewer visas are actually being issued. Um, and uh, we also help by uh, using what we call the interagency working group we have people representing 24 federal agencies on a committee to help resolve questions of foreign companies. I had a uh, Finnish company trying to develop a single engine seaplane. And they didn't know which treaty, multilateral treaty or bilateral treaty, applied to their engine and their plane to get it certified by the Federal Aviation Administration. They had hired expensive consultants paid a lot of money without getting an answer for two years. Luckily, we have this working group. I called up the gentleman from the Federal Aviation Administration. I said, aren't you part of the people trying to help us promote investment? Within two weeks, we knew the answer very clearly, which treaty applied, how they needed to have their airplanes certified. And to help future investors, the uh, Federal Aviation Administration decided to post a few more treaties on their website that they had somehow not put on their website. So now anyone can find all these treaties, even the ones back from the 60s and 70s that are still in force today. So we try and improve and make it easier. Uh, also at the federal level, we have an investment advisory council. Uh, this has the current version has two sides. One is helping foreign companies invest. Another one is helping U.S. companies that want to bring factories back from overseas to the United States. And uh, we call that Select USA for U.S. Companies. Susa Fusa. <laughs> and uh, so we'll have two advisory councils, each with 20 people giving advice to the Secretary of Commerce on a quarterly basis. And this is a very good. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how we do it. This is a simple sample of one of the customized research reports we give to foreign companies. Usually eight to ten pages. How much does it cost? We don't charge a penny. <coughs> Because we know that, uh, first of all, we don't want to compete with the private sector. Number two, we know with many foreign companies, we want to stay away from the risk of bribery. So we just give it for free. And it's a starting point. It helps them see 
where the uh, you know state by state what the various uh, labor rates are in their industry. Sometimes they ask how much does electricity cost? You know how many many different things. So we use as much as we can. This is an example of a cluster map for the medical device sector, and you will notice that if some medical device company from Japan or China came and I wanted to highlight the hidden opportunities. And this one is, we can make map state by state, county by county, or by metropolitan area. And this particular one is metropolitan area. It shows this Chicago is definitely one of those high potential areas. And this is a wonderful tool because it's free for anyone to use. And we could actually do a, a webinar, teach you how to use this tool to help attract investment. It's a cluster mapping tool. And uh, there are 53 different industry sectors. You get on there, you can choose the dates back five years, 10 years, 20 years. And uh, then you choose whether it's by state, by county, or by city. And it shows. Very quickly, Chicago, you know, if you do it by county by county, you can simply get a subset of that for the Chicago area. County by county, employment in any one of these 50, 53 different industries. And it can create a very compelling uh, graphic to show that there is a lot of opportunity, a lot of skilled labor. We also sometimes leverage something called Statebook. This is a private company that has a website um, it's not always uh, completely up to date. There's a few mm -hmm. cities and towns that have decided not to put their data there, so there's a few holes in it, but it's a quick way to get a comparison of two or three different city states and see the pros and cons. This is an example of comparison. Um, we also get people information about state business incentives, but we do not advise them on them. We decide that that's up to the states to do. Uh, but there's also a wonderful website uh, that we can introduce. It'll show at least a list and description of every state incentive uh, available state by state. And uh, we don't explain it. We connect them to the right people in each state or county to help those foreign companies calculate what incentives may be available. So, one of our events um, is the Select USA Summit. And before I explain that, I'd like to let you know that's only one of our events. Our embassies and consulates are organizing Select USA events around the world every month, almost every week more than 200 events around the world. Sometimes we have uh, small luncheons hosted by the ambassador. Sometimes we will give speeches at the local American Chamber of Commerce or Foreign Chamber of Commerce. Um, sometimes we will go to trade shows. Uh, we have a lot of different things, and uh, the, this is our biggest event of the year. And there are 1,000 investors that come from around the world. They are recruited by our partner organizations and by our embassies. Uh, today, I have one of our partner organizations joining us for lunch. So I'd like to introduce very briefly uh, the China General Chamber of Commerce there. Uh, Ms. Wen Yue Zhang is here. The China General Chamber of Commerce helps us recruit Chinese companies from across China for the summit every year. And that's why China has had more than over 100 investors at the summit every year in a row. So this year, uh, it's in June, and we're looking forward to seeing you. And uh, thank you for your time this morning. And Bruce, I think we have, and Bruce, thank you very much. I think we have one time. Uh, time for one question from um, Teresa. So, uh, Teresa. Um, well, actually, I have two questions. On the cluster mapping, the Harvard Business Cluster Mapping. Yes. I've, I've used that many times. It's 2014 data. Are they going to update that at any point? Do you know? They update it every year. Okay, because it says 2014 on it. Yes. 
Well, in a few years, in another year, it'll say 2015. So it's probably <laughs> <long ago. laughs> gotcha. they update it every year, but there's always about a three-year lag. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then the next question: If we have a company, or if, if we're working with a company, and we need to connect to your data person, yes, who do we call for that? You call me or Hovan, and we connect you. We can call you directly. Yes, you can. But there's someone in my office named Steve Miller who yes. is usually in charge of uh, the Chicago area. Okay. He's the best person, especially after I go to Asia this summer. Okay. Um, and when you ask for a research report, make sure you tell them that you only want the Chicago area. Right. So, so we that's could what call you want. Them and say we want that report that you just did, but we want it for the Chicago region. Yes. Yes. And we work with Steve often. We talk about monthly. We talk to him. Right. So great. Thank you. Oh, Shai. Uh, so the thousand investors and all the people who come to the Select USA conference, uh, and we're trying to bring them to the communities to make investments. Uh, are these people vetted in any way for them to get into the Select USA conference, so that we know that there would be good people for us to bring to the communities? Yes, they go through a, a three-step vetting process. First, people in our embassy or consulate check them out. And we don't necessarily check their bank accounts, no. We just check to make sure that there's someone that either we know or we don't know them. We will search some databases for past issues, corruptions, scandals. Then I check for my region. Finally, they have to get a visa. And there's another check when they apply for a visa. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that these co these companies want to invest tomorrow, but they're thinking of investing. They want to learn. Some of them end up investing soon. Some take two or three years. Some end up not investing after all. They go to another country, uh, but uh, they are vetted. They're vetted before they come to the community. Yes. So for the benefit of the guests here today that have probably never been um, familiar with the conference or the summer of Select USA, and you did a great job at describing the benefits. It's Thank you. I really appreciate having your guests here as well. Um, are there some nuggets that you can provide, or one nugget, to the communities here that helps to make Select Chicago the best uh, spin-off area hmm. as compared to our counterparts across the country? Anything that you well, like to... for spinoffs, um, I will say uh, when people sign up to come to the summit, they look at the agenda and they look to see if their industry is on the agenda. If they don't see a breakout session or some topic related to their industry, oftentimes they say, that's not my, not for me. Uh, so uh, we end up having more good investors sign up for the summit in the industry sectors that are on the agenda in some way. It's just a natural sort of self-selection. When they don't see their, their industry, they say, why would I do that? When they see it, they say, oh, that's my, my space. Um, so the first thing is try to link it to some of those industry sector themes. The second thing is you, we have an app that you can use to request meetings with people who have registered. Now, in the first three months of the year, most of the people who have registered are EEOs. Then we get the service providers registering. And most of the actual investors don't sign up until April, May, and June. And by then, you have so many people registered, it's a little bit overwhelming to figure out who is there. But we're going to try and do a better job of providing information to investors with cluster maps and things like that. We're doing a better job of highlighting. So last year, when, when investors register, registered for the summit, they weren't shown a screen about the spin-offs. They had to go to our website and find that separately. This year, they are shown a screen. Don't forget to register for a spin-off. So we're doing extra things to try to encourage these 1,000 investors to stay an extra week or come a week early and attend spin-offs. That's great. And use the matchmaking to request meetings and advertising. Every week, put something on the matchmaking app.
Yeah. No, and, and actually, Bruce, that's what we started doing last year, yeah. as in starting to use that matchmaking app. And also one of the other things is there's a high degree of churn that happens with the investors that come and go. And now that I think we've been five times, this year be our fifth time, we've been developing a full database of the people who've come in the past. And our big event is not going to be directly after or before the summit. We started talking to the people who, uh, when we were in D.C., would say, oh, I'd like to come. I met you at this show. Well, maybe I'd like to come a couple months later, enjoy Chicago summer. So uh, this is a great segue of starting to go into uh, wrap, wrapping up in next steps. And so, Bruce, I want to thank you very thank much you for making the trip out. Thank you, so thank you, Bruce. And I'm going to turn this over to Karen Kahn, who is our program director for Select Chicago. So they let me be on the stage today, which is fine, but actually most of the work comes from Karen. So.